Hi everyone, welcome to the Low Gag Reading Group. In this meeting, we have the paper Grunt, Graph Neurodiffusion, which introduces a new type of GNNs, and the follow up paper Beltrami Flow and Neurodiffusion on Graphs. These are presented by the joint first authors Dr. Benjamin Paul Chamberlain and James Robotten, who did this work in the Twitter Graph Research team of Professor Michael Bronstein. We're happy if you join our discussions as well, and the link for that is in the description. Let's go. Hi, everyone. Today we have James and Ben from Twitter Research. And I guess they will probably also say some words about that. And yeah, we will have two papers today, more or less. I think we will also be touching a lot on the follow up paper of Grant. And Grant Graph Neural Diffusion is the, the main paper today. But then, yeah, go ahead, Ben. Great. Well, Hannes, thanks very much for inviting us. This is a super cool reading group you've built up. And the previous papers are some of my favorites for the last few years. Uh, so it's uh, really nice for James and I to get an invite. And, and also thanks everyone to, for coming and spending an hour listening to us. So this is going to be about two papers, the um, papers we had at ICML and now at NeurIPS this year called Grand and then Blend. And the broad area we're talking about is uh, graph neural networks and diffusion PDEs. And if you want to find out more about this and more about what we're working on in the future, then these are our Twitter handles. So uh, give us a follow. Oh, and of course, <clears throat> as this is sort of a reading group as well, please jump in with questions at any time. Uh, we don't want this to be too formal or anything. But the first thing uh, to cover then is why should anyone care about, uh, about graph neural uh, PDEs? Like why, why is that an important thing? And it's an important thing because graph neural networks have been blowing up recently. And in these two papers, we show how a broad class of graph neural networks can be seen as discretizations of PDEs or specifically the diffusion PDE. And, diffusion, and uh, PDEs have been around for quite a lot longer than graph neural networks. And so it's a, it's a nice thing if you can delve into the last four or 500 years of mathematical development and pull through some of the, some of the, I guess, the greatest hits and then apply them to things you're currently working on. It turns out that many of the greatest minds in history have worked uh, in a large part on PDEs. So I don't know if uh, anyone knows who these guys are down here. The one on the left is commonly regarded as the greatest Briton of all time, Isaac Newton. And then we've got Fourier Laplace. That guy uh, just to the right, he's a, he's a patent clerk from Austria. And um, I'm actually not sure who the furthest one is. Maybe James over there. Is that Fourier? Anyway, maybe Laplace. Maybe Laplace. Okay. Yeah, maybe. Okay, so moving on. Broad outline then of the talk is um, I'll do a, a quick overview of diffusion PDEs um, and then how these things do connect to graph neural networks. A lot of the work we've done, we have somewhat shamelessly taken straight out of image processing from the 90s. So this is uh, the idea of using PDEs to do things like in-painting and removing noise in images was a super popular idea before CNNs blew up. And we've, uh, we've sort of modernized and borrowed a lot of that and applied it to graphs. Then James is going to go into the details of GRAND, which will require a little, uh, oh yeah, and then we'll talk a little bit about position encodings for graphs because without position encodings for graphs, we can't really do blend. Okay, so diffusion PDEs. I think maybe uh, we've gone back a little bit too far here, but I'm going to start with Newton. Newton is the first person really to formulate uh, diffusion in a heat-like way. And actually what he said is that, um, that you can describe the heat equation as a sort of law of cooling where the rate of change of heat at any point is proportional to the local differences. So it was a bit, it was a bit imprecise, given that he's the father of calculus, but that's, a, that's how he did it. And then it took about 120 years before Fourier formulated this thing, the, the heat equation, as an actual uh, partial differential equation. And the last little bit was done a meager 30 years later uh, by Thick. <clears throat> who wrote these things down as a conservation law. So what Thick essentially says is that the change of heat at any given point 
is equal to the sum of the inflows and outflows at that point. And that's what, uh, if you are a little bit unfamiliar with vector calculus, that's what the div is. The div is giving you the sum of the inflows and outflows at a given point. And diffusion takes many, many different forms in science. So the, the, classic, the classic form is of a continuous substance like heat moving in a continuous space like an iron bar. And then we get the, the classic entropy always increases in a, in a closed body type of diffusion. And we'll touch on that again throughout the talk because the idea that entropy always increases in a closed body is very heavily tied to the idea of over smoothing in graph neural networks. Because when we see that things like GCN and SGC are really just heat flow equations, then it's not at all surprising that they suffer from oversmoothing. You can also have heat flow as a diffusion, sorry, as a Brownian motion. So particles moving in a continuous field. Um, now, interestingly, Einstein actually spent like a large part of his PhD studying Brownian motion. And I didn't realize this. And I'm, a, I'm a former physicist and obviously a massive Einstein fan, but his work during his PhD led to it was a sort of the final nail in the coffin for do atoms exist or not. Um, and he formulated that by studying diffusion. And then the part that's probably most relevant to us is uh, this idea that you can also have diffusion in a completely discrete domain. And um, in that case, the most common example is probably Google's page rank. And, and the formulation that we're most familiar with from the GNN community is this sort of a multiplying Laplacian by some sort of feature matrix. So far, I've just talked about really simple homogeneous diffusion where the, the medium is homogeneous. So it, diffusion is the same everywhere and in every direction. And when it gets a bit more interesting is when you have a medium of diffusion that isn't homogeneous. Uh, and that is normally expressed through this, uh, this diffusivity uh, constant or function. And we, you'll see in grand that we, we use this second form of diffusion equation and that diffusivity term is something we learn as an attention function and even more um, interesting and this is something we're hoping to deliver in the future it's actually in part what Gabriele was looking at is an idea of having an, an anisotropic diffusion so now not only does it change in space but also the diffusion speed is different depending on which direction you're going So what has all of this got to do with graph neural networks? Well, the answer is uh, fortunately quite a simple one. So the vast majority of graph neural networks out there at the moment are message passing graph neural networks. And message passing is just diffusion um, under the hood. So if you have the idea that each node has some function of its features and pops that function off to all of its neighbors, and then when it gets there, you aggregate all of the incoming messages in some way. Well, depending on that aggregation function, depending on your diffusivity, if you will, that is nothing other than discrete diffusion. Possibly I put too many of these messages in here. Then uh, this sort of begs the question of how do you get from this uh, continuous PD? So I'm seeing a few chats, I'm just gonna check them quickly. Nothing sweet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, Leibniz, yeah. Newton. Yeah, they're good. <laughs> I like that. I think it depends where you were born, um, Dominique. Um, okay. Uh, so, yes, let's, let's start with the continuous equa equation here continuous time and continuous space. And um, I'm going to do the spatial discretization first. So, luckily, spatial discretization of these differential operators is really, really, if anything, more intuitive on a graph than it is in continuous space. So the, the gradient on a graph is a function that lives on the edges and is nothing more than the difference of some field on the nodes. The divergence is well, it's the sum of the inflows and outflows. So it lives on a node and it's just the sum of this edge field, this edge gradient field. And when you put all those things together, you end up with the equation at the bottom, which starts to look a lot like the message passing function of a graph neural network. That, that's assuming, of course, that you believe that there's nothing more interesting going on in the continuous space than the given graph. And a lot, I think a lot of the most exciting work 
in this area coming going forwards is this idea that you, you shouldn't be tied to the given graph. And this is, I think this is very much starting to happen a lot in, in new graph um, GNM papers, where people are giving up on the idea of having to do computation on the data graph effectively. And you could argue that uh, many people have already done this. So in, in Sage, I think they, they sample a fixed number of neighbors, something like 20 or whatever. Uh, in our sign paper, we use these multi-hop uh, filters, so we're not using the exact graph. I think, uh, am I right in thinking the bottleneck paper was last week here? So in the bottleneck paper, again, they, they use a complete graph as a final layer. So again, giving up on the idea of the computational graph. We, in our papers, uh, in Grand, we use Deagle, so we, we diffuse the graph and rewire it, but they show that generally using the given graph is, uh, you can improve graph neural networks by not using the given graph. So this idea of thinking about an underlying continuous manifold, which is the thing on the right-hand side of the differential equation, and then discretizing it in some way that's more interesting than just using the given graph is, um, is something we'll come back to in, in the work we did in Blend, and we, we touch on it a bit in Grant. The temporal hands, side, oh, sorry, does, go ahead. Does Hans have, Hans have a question about the rewiring? Yeah, I just want to ask about the, the Deagle rewiring. Like, do we just take a, um, do we dare just take a, like a diffusion that gives us a value for each node when we are looking from the perspective of one node, so like a value from each node to each other node, and then we have some threshold and based on that we rewire the graph. Exactly that. I, I've actually got a slide where I, I use the Deagle uh, figure. and I, I'll go over the details. So the densification and sparsification. Yeah. It's in a few slides. Are there any, any other questions at this point as well? Sorry, I've not been looking at the chat. I've just got a single monitor here. Um, so nothing in the chat, but uh, nothing in the uh, chat. No, five of calculus. Okay, very good. Um, Anyone else have any any questions on anything so far before I move on? Okay, good. Well, I will go ahead with this. Um, it's quite a lot going on in this slide. I don't know how familiar everyone is with the neural ordinary differential equations work. So this is a Ricky Chen and um, Duvano and uh, Yulia Robinova and some other people I've probably forgotten. Uh, this this image is now quite famous, I think, at least in I think it's quite famous because the paper won the best paper at NeurIPS uh, probably 2018. And until this paper, I think like the, the idea of trying to do a graph neural networks, ARPDEs would have seemed a bit fanciful because the temporal discretization part would have been a bit of a stretch, I think. Whereas now the idea of thinking of neural networks as discretizations of partial differential equations where time takes the role of the layer index is actually, is, you know, it's, a, it's pretty much an accepted idea in the machine learning community now. And what, um, what uh, Chen et al pointed out was that if you take, um, take a ResNet, then a ResNet is um, one type of discretization of an ordinary differential equation where you have a, a forward Euler step and you have a time step of one. And this, uh, this picture on the right here is, um, so what, it took me a while actually to work out what this picture was. So I think what they've done here is that they have taken a vector field, which is the thing you're trying to learn. So that's effectively what your parameters are in your neural network. And then they've run the forward pass of an ODE solver Oops. through that. And on the, on the right-hand side, they've used a, what's called an adaptive ODE solver. So they've run it, whatever that is, seven times. And because it's adaptive, it uh, uses an adaptive time step. So you get these kind of different layer indexes, which are the black dots. And on the left-hand side, they've used uh, what I think is probably a forward Euler with fixed step size. So you get this regular grid, which corresponds to your kind of classic neural network. Oh yeah, the link, good, thanks. Cool, okay, so that's uh, how we do temporal discretization. So hopefully, I've given you an idea that uh, PDEs are intimately connected to graph neural networks. And the reason that's important is because it gives us new perspectives on problems like over smoothing and bottleneck and um, over squashing. Uh, also, new architectures that are inspired by numerical ODE solvers. And people have spent a couple of hundred years worrying about the stability of partial differential equations. 
Now, if you if you can make that leap and, and think a graph neural network actually is a numerical solution to a PDE, then all of that stability mathematics applies directly to graph neural networks. You also then can access new domains inspired by PDEs. And so we have some work that's currently under review that looks at Ricci flow, for instance. All right. <clears throat> so all of this, as I said before, kind of has been done by the image processing people from about the, you know, the 90s, including Michael Bronstein, who was uh, Kimmel's uh, PhD student, I believe. So he, and Michael's been working on this stuff for 30 years. There's a massive dichotomy uh, in the variational methods image processing community between whether an image is continuous or whether an image is discrete. And I guess the argument here is, you know, the real world is sort of continuous if you ignore quantum mechanics. And, um, and you know, these days we have 10 megapixel cameras, maybe there are even 100 megapixel cameras, I don't know, I'm not a photographer. But um, effectively, you can say, oh, you know, these things are in the limit sort of continuous now. And once you say that, then an image becomes a continuous function. And the right way to describe the evolution of that function is using a differential equation. Now, the alternative, of course, is to say, well, actually, you know, we always have these things on computers, therefore, they're always just tensors, and so we should just be using linear algebra. Now, this, this is a, like an ongoing debate. It hasn't been resolved or anything. But the really compelling thing about using the continuous case in image processing, and I think people mostly agree who do image processing on this, is that you then unlock the tools that the greatest minds in history have helped develop, whereas with the discrete mathematics, the tools are more limited. Now, this is a really like quite massive area in, in image processing that I knew absolutely nothing about because my image processing pretty much starts with convolutional neural networks. So we had to learn about all of this stuff when we were, when we were writing these papers. There are about you know, 10 different textbooks on variational methods in image processing. And what these guys have known for quite a long time is that if you want to denoise an image, you can do diffusion on the image and it, and it sort of works. But if you do regular homogeneous diffusion, what happens is you just end up over smoothing the image. And instead, if you do anisotropic diffusion, at least they call it anisotropic diffusion in the, in the field, then you can preserve the edges of an image and get like a much better denoising. I think the next slide is gonna be a video of that, but it might not be. It's not, okay. Um, so here we have a picture of Newton. Uh, the left is the original image. The center is what happens when you do homogeneous diffusion. And the equation for homogeneous diffusion is just a, uh, at the top there with a constant diffusivity. Now, what the computer vision people did, because they didn't really do machine learning, they, they derived a, um, it's not a fix, they derived a, 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 what's the word for something that isn't learned, but is still a function, I don't know, for that thing, um, diffusivity. This is called the Perona Malik equation. And it's actually derived through, um, through variational methods. So through solving something called the Euler-Lagrange equation, which is um, mega, compl mega common in physics. It's like a power how the, the other way of formulating mechanics instead of Newton's way. So it's a, it's a pretty well studied thing. This is the video I thought was coming on the last slide, but is in fact this slide. So on the left, you have again, the over smoothing constant diffusivity. And on the right, you have this peronomalic diffusivity which is, which, you know, cartoonizes an image, it protects the edges. So this filter here in the denominator, you have the norm of the gradient. So the idea is if the intensity changes, if the color or intensity channel changes a lot, then you have high, you have an edge. And so not much diffusion can occur over an edge, which is you know, the thing you want really. And so applying this to graphs, we've shown that this is clearly a graph because we put a grid on top of Newton. Uh, GCN does something like homogeneous diffusion. GATT has a inhomogeneous diffusion where you, where you learn the diffusivity. And this magical as yet undiscovered GNN, which we think we were hoping, Dominic, would be sort of inspired by your directional uh, graph neural networks, but we couldn't really get it to work yet. Um, is, uh, is something we're hoping to discover in the future. Ooh, what's this? This paper we should use is Ricci Curvature. Oh yeah, okay, good. I was gonna say with Ricci Curvature, um, the idea is like, so I like to picture it, if you've got like a 3D peanut 
<laughs> peanuts as a compostable neck in the middle, like a bridge. And you you run the diffusion, it, it pushes it towards the sphere. And you can you can really kind of imagine that that's like the area with the high curvature where there is a bottleneck it kind of adds more edges. So it overcomes overcomes this kind of compression idea. I think Ben's Ben's got a slide on it later. Yeah, it's uh yeah. Um okay, so that's that's the end of the first section, which was the introduction to the general idea of uh diffusion PDEs being related to graph neural networks. Any final questions before I hand over to James? Cool. In that case, I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen over yours, Ben. Hopefully, hopefully it's a seamless transition. Let me know when you're on and I'll stop sharing here. Uh, yeah. I am. Uh, we'll see this. Good. Cool. Okay. Uh, so hopefully in, in Ben's section, he's kind of justified that a diffusion process does exist inside a GNN by the graph diffusion equation. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some of the details of our first paper grant, uh, which was at ICML this year. Um, Hopefully I'm gonna show that we can generate new architectures for GNNs via considering different temporal and spatial discretizations of the PDE. Uh, so first of all, if you start with the graph diffusion equation, which is equation two in our paper, uh, it's first nice to show that we can recover a simple GNN. So if you uh, take the explicit Euler discretization, uh, so you, xk plus one minus xk divided by tau to represent the temporal derivative. When you set the time step equals to one, you can see that the xk's cancel. And what you get is a simplified version of GCN. So with GCN, you'd, you'd have xk plus one sigma of a xkw. So here we don't have the w, which is effectively equates to mixing the feature channels and the nonlinearity doesn't, it isn't applied as well because we run the diffusion process. Um, now, explicit Euler is a very simple temporal discretization. As Ben was talking, we want to bring in some of the theory, the hundreds of years of theory of differential equation solvers into our architecture. So there's, there's better ODE solvers. Uh, the first category would be a multi-step method. So this uses a linear combination of, I guess, previous predictions and interim gradients to give you a better estimate for the gradient that you're trying to derive. Um, it essentially uses the, the intermediate value theorem. So you can you can see here the picture. This is of a, a method called Runge cutter four, uh, and it takes these k one k two up to k four. They're they're the slopes, and it linearly combines them. Uh, so what the coefficients? So these alphas and betas are calculated uh, for this linear combination. We essentially take a Taylor series approximation, uh, and we we desire to make it consistent with like a, a fourth order Taylor series approximation. So the local truncation error would be order five in the step size. So as you decrease the step size, the error gets smaller. Um, the thinking about Taylor series approximation is a nice viewpoint to think about the, another type of ODE solver that's, that's kind of better. So adaptive step size solvers. So these work by, say you have an order P and an order P minus one solver. Uh, which you can, it's quite cheap to compute both because they share like interim steps. And then you can look at the error between these two, two solvers and compare it to some tolerance. Um, and then if the, if the error is bigger than the tolerance, the solver can kind of iteratively know that it needs to reduce the step size. And by reducing the step size, it reduces the error. Uh, and then conversely, if, if the error is within the tolerance, the solver can kind of work out that it can take a bigger step size and speed up because maybe there's not high curvature in that region. So there's not gonna be much integration error by taking a bigger time step. So interesting, when we apply this to our, this, our architecture, the temporal discretization is not known a priori. The solver calculate it, calculates it on the fly and it's different every epoch as the way it's solved. Uh, can I so just interrupt there? Yeah, sure. Oh. Um, okay. uh, no, can we go back two slides? This guy? No, no, one more. Yeah, yes. exactly. So what we have here is that we're like 
um, taking our we're yeah we're taking our diffusion given by this your graph diffusion formula there and we're yeah always taking us or we we have our initial x and then we're getting our x k plus one by adding a tau like and tau is our step size uh, tau times the diffusion of our initial features so we yeah so we take our initial features and we add to them a little bit of our diffused features right scaled by the time step yeah so yeah. I, I like to think like i like to think like the minus i you throw everything away so you throw away your features uh and then the a the adjacency so in practice this is like row normalized to sum to one in like a soft max so it's essentially like so in in like a, a normalized graph laplacian that would be like one over the degree to sum to one but it's it's a weighted sum from your neighbors okay uh, so, so exactly right. our our new or, or the new gnn evolves the or yeah no not the new gnn here the the graph diffusion equation evolves the features by taking the original or our our time step now and then adding a little bit of a diffused version of the features now and then if you do the multi-step thing like do you just have different step sizes and then average the step sizes like uh, on the next slide you have this multi-step yeah, so, so so be careful to there's, there's different things so the multi-step it takes interim step sizes. So you can see this H over two here. Uh, so it's essentially like you're taking an average of the gradients to give you a better gradient. But so the adaptive step size solver, which is another class of solvers, and you can of course, of course combine these two types of solvers, but the adaptive step size will, that decides the size of H. So whether you can take a big step or a small step, but the, but the scheme is the same. Is actually, I think it's the next slide. Yeah, okay. Then let's just uh, go on for now. Um, I, I was, I was going to say, um, obviously, like in, in a, one of the stability properties from ResNet is you're just learning the incremental difference, right? So in the derivative, rather than just like a, le learning the full next layer, you just learn the differences. So that's, that's why it's more stable. Dominique, hi. I see your hand. Yeah. Um... I have a question like regarding this uh, Runge Kuta. Um, I, I don't know too much about the recent literature of neural ODEs, so I would like to know is it something that is typically used in uh, neural ODEs in other areas than graphs? Or is it, um, or do they usually use the implicit uh, Euler only? Yeah, so, so, so with the neural ODE paper, one of the, the main contributions was a really nice library uh, called Torch Diff EQ. Um, and I guess I guess the neural ODE paper they kind of talk about being able to use black box solvers. Um, so I, I think in that library it's just uh, there's just an argument, and I think there's like so there's dot five, which is an adaptive step size. We use it a lot in our experiments. Runge cutter four is kind of like I guess it's your standard explicit solver that you go to. Um, and then yeah, also explicit solvers. Some I'll show in a bit. We did we in in the paper we did some experiments to compare in, implicit solvers and explicit solvers because uh, they have different stability properties and this this kind of thing. Um, it's it's also a linear problem versus a nonlinear problem, uh, like in in the, in the numerical analysis literature. Uh, linear problems are, are much easier to state. Uh, stability properties for because you need to calculate the eigenvalues of like the Jacobian and when it's linear the Jacobian is the transition matrix but when when it's non-linear transition matrix changes every step so you can't guarantee or you need negative eigenvalues and you can't guarantee that that happens every step when it changes um, so yeah stability gets hard with non-linear problems um, and here, uh, when you're using the adjacency matrix for the diffusion, if you're taking k steps, uh, does that mean that you're considering like k neighbors, like the, the k distant neighbors in the differential equation or, um, or are the steps in time? Like, uh, I'm not sure if my question is clear. Yeah, so I guess, so like what, so the, if, you, if you just square the adjacency matrix, then it's a two hop, right? Um, so I guess let's look at the form 
Oh, excuse me, I keep clicking. Uh, yeah, let's go to let's go to this slide. So th this slide is trying to look at. Um, so before I was just kind of motivating uh, numerical solvers in the scalar case, uh, and I'll, I'll introduce the implicit one later when we get down to here. But with the explicit scheme, what you actually now have instead instead of just the scalars are this is our feature matrix X, so it's n by d. Uh, and then this a hat is um, it's just a condensed version of uh, the a minus i on the previous slide. Um, yeah, so I guess you have a coupled system, right? So every node has an ODE, uh, and they're coupled via this adjacency matrix. Um, and every time you make an application of the adjacency matrix, so every time you take a step in the ODE solver, it is like a step in, I guess, just a normal Laplacian diffusion, but it's, I guess it's scaled by this time step tau, which is, which is optimized for the solver. Um, yeah, uh, and then I guess it's quite interesting if you look at the runge kosov four method here. So what I'm trying to show is uh, like, it's, it's like um, a recursive implementation. Uh, so, so, so this, it's, it's like a linear combination. So you, you're given these coefficients, like the one six, one third. It's like a linear combination of these guys to give you what would actually be the next step. Uh, and then, yeah, so also to talk about implicit solvers. So the, the kind of the definition of, a, of an implicit scheme is you're, you're trying to estimate, uh, let me go back actually one slide because it's just easier to see. So, so explicit, you're xi, excuse the change in notation, uh, but you're just, you're trying to guess the next step by extrapolating the gradient from that point xi. In an implicit solver, you actually use the gradient at the point in time that you're trying to guess the value of. So that, that's just the definition of an implicit solver. Um, it doesn't seem like much. There's, I'll show this, it gives you actually speed and stability properties. Um, but then when you run it through in the matrix form, you actually get this matrix B here. Um, and B is sparse because the sparsity structure in a graph, but that doesn't mean that B inverse because you need to inverse this matrix to isolate to make the next step X, K plus one. So when you inverse this, this B minus one, it actually gives you like a, a dense matrix, like a denser matrix. So it's like a richer spatial support for the, the spatial derivative. Um, so yeah, I guess that kind of covers all I wanted to talk about in terms of the ODE solvers. Uh, Hans, I'm, I can see you typing and I'm missing the chats. Do I need to pay attention? The no, no. Uh, ben uh, answers a few questions there. Yeah, a few questions there, but I'm just noting stuff down. Oh man, here's your here's your Deagle slide. Anyway, um, you were asking, so <laughs> that was not seamless, wasn't it? Uh, so everything before with the ODE solvers was kind of talking about the temporal discretization. Uh, now we're we're claiming that we have a PDE, so a kind of evolutionary PDE on the left hand side is temporal, and then the right hand side you have the spatial derivatives. So we're saying how can we more effectively discretize the spatial side of PDE? So in Grand, uh, we just use it, uh, we use Deagle, Diffusion Improves Graph Learning. So there's two steps to Deagle. Uh, the first is like densification of the edges. So this is like a polynomial expansion of some transition matrix. So like some coefficient times a plus another coefficient a squared plus a cubed a to the four. So one hop, two hop, three hop. And it will give you weights to put on the edges. And those weights like represent uh, the landing probability. So in a random walk, you go from node i to node j. And um, so that will give you a denser matrix. Um, and then you can sparsify that uh, by choosing some threshold for those landing probabilities. Um, so heuristically, what we do in Grand is we, we slightly densify our given graph. Um, we think that, so as the bottleneck paper was saying last week, we think that kind of overcomes some of the bottlenecks as like more edges for information to travel. Um, and then I, I, I use the word heuristically, what we do after we've slightly densified is we, through the training process, we kind of prune our graph. So we'll, we'll threshold on these new learned attention values of diffusivity coefficients uh, to sparsify to, to kind of give us our resultant graph for inference. Okay, how am I doing for time? Yeah, I think okay, I'll, I'll go fast. Um, so 
looking at a graph diffusion equation as a PDE gives us some nice stability results as well. There's two types of stability results. First is to do with like the, the actual differential equation. So uh, in maths, there's like an epsilon delta. I'm not going to try and read it. There's like an epsilon delta definition for the concept of stability in a differential equation. It's closely related to the idea of robustness in machine learning. So we're all familiar with like small perturbations in the input data should mean a small perturbation in the output data. Um, so an image is like, so say you have a noisy picture of a cat, whatever the noise, you still want to predict the cat, right? Um, and then in a, in a differential equation example, I like this the pendulum example. So uh, we've got a phase diagram. So which x1 and x2 are the angular displacement and velocity. And the dynamics are given by these two ODEs. And there's, a, there's two stable regions, two stability equilibrium, sorry, two equilibrium points, not better stable. So the equilibrium point on the left is the origin, which is the pendulum at the bottom with zero displacement or velocity. And then the, the equilibrium point at the top is the pendulum arm like precariously balanced with no velocity or displacement. So you can imagine a small perturbation to either the speed or velocity here could result in a very different path. So that's kind of like an unstable point. So we show in grand that our learning problems like the stable case. Uh, so it's nice and we're stable. Um, so the second type of stability result is not on the differential equation, but it's on like the numerical solver. So don't get confused, there's like complex numbers suddenly appear here, but these are like three classical stability diagrams for numerical solvers. So um, what it does is it, it couples the step size h with lambda. So this lambda is the eigenvalue of the Jacobian of the transition matrix. So you can think of it as like the linearized spatial derivative. Um, so like, oh yeah, I should say like, the gray region is the area of stability for this solver. So you expect in these regions, as you get smaller, the, the solver converges on the, the true solution. Um, so for explicit Euler, it kind of says, we want the real part of the eigenvalue of the Jacobian the transition matrix to be negative. And then we want to take a sufficiently small step size that we land in the gray region. Uh, implicit Euler is almost, almost unconditionally stable. And then I guess the thing to say about Runge Kutter is, it's bigger than explicit Euler. Um, it's a, you'd expect that is a higher order method and it gives you a better gradient approximation. Again, in grand, we have like a normalized adjacency matrix that rows sums to one. So, so we can just prove some special cases of this. So like it, we show that for a graph diffusion equation, like implicit Euler is unconditionally stable. So you can take a time step for the full, the full step, uh, the full inference time. Yes. Um, cool. So just a few more slides about the architecture. This is just to show that the grand architecture is like most modern GN, GNNs. So we use an encoder and a decoder. Um, I guess the main difference is instead of the concept of discrete layers in the middle, we now have an ODE solver. So, so we're taking steps as chosen by the OD, ODE solver, which is discretizing our continuous time. And the encoder effectively gives us the initial conditions to the PDE. Uh, and yeah, we can re replace the edges of the graph with some rewired edges. Um, so what are we actually doing when we like different, so when we back prop or when we, we don't talk about it, but like uh, in the presentation, but when you can either back prop or you can use something called the adjoint method. Both of them essentially give you the sensitivities from the loss function to the parameters theta. But what are these parameters theta? Um, we're essentially learning the diffusivity or controlling the dynamics by learning the diffusivity. Um, you can put some inductive bias by saying, I want that form to be like, so we, we, we found that scaled dot products from transformer attention works well. Uh, I think this is because the dot product is kind of analogous with distance, which has a meaning in diffusion. But it, but this is essentially where we're learning our edge detector. So like Ben's example of Perona mallet, this edge, which isn't a learned, uh, which isn't a learned function, but this is where we get our edge detection from. Uh, okay, so I didn't explicitly say, but uh, we introduced three types of grand in our paper. The first one is kind of like a simplified version. So we'll calculate the attention values just based off X naught, which is like the initial conditions of the ODE. Um, that gives you a, an analytical solution actually. 
um, but, it, but the analy analytical solutions in like matrix exponential form, which you can only get from like a Taylor series expansion uh, or diagonalizing. Um, so we don't actually recover it. Um, and then the second form, which we think is more expressive is where every step in the ODE solver will recalculate the attentions. Um, we call that grand nonlinear. And then the third, I guess we've covered where we, we decouple the Gibbon and the computational graph by uh, rewiring. Uh, okay, so just to cover two experiments that we did in the paper. This first one, I guess, it's, it's essentially the same as the image diffusion that Ben showed earlier. So with the constant diffusivity, which, which we kind of say here is GCN, you so, oh, sorry guys, yeah, I see some hands. I'll take questions. That's good. Who first? Dominic. Yeah, well, then I'll I, go I think first. You, you can finish. Uh, uh, Let's go, Hannes. <laughs> okay. Well then, um, did you also try this with GCNs that also have shared layers? Like the your grant, it shares the, the weights across the layers, so to say. If you take the um, GCN or the, yeah, the GCN grant anal analogy, and did you also try it, try a GCN with shared weights per layer? No, um, I, actually, maybe this maybe this GCN. So I guess the weights. So the adjacency matrix in the GCN is fixed, right? And the weights. Uh, so the A X W. So the W is the piece where the the yeah. weights are learned. This, this is the channel mixing, right? Um, honestly, I'm not sure. It'll be the same. I think there are results. There's two papers that look at the oversmoothing of GCN. And it's um, it's because it's a retraction map, isn't it? Yeah, so it, it won't it won't help. But we didn't do the experiments. Yeah, I think honestly at this point, I think it, it would have been also relevant to do a GAT because uh, GAT does have attention. Uh, we didn't do it, but I, th I think it, it might be illuminating as as to where in this picture that, that GAT appears. We might find that it's not stable because we, we did see in some of our experiments that uh, GAT doesn't seem to be as stable as GAT. Um, but I think that's definitely a critique of this. Um, but but yeah, generally, uh, what I want to say about this is it is the same as the image example. It just kind of shows over smoothing where uh, grand can go deeper because of the edge detection. Um, let me. I've got one more slide on experiments, and then I'll, it's the end of my bit, so I can take my final questions. So this this slide is just is to show the trade off between uh, speed and step size and stability. So there's, there's three things to point out. So like Dominic's question earlier about implicit solvers. So the block lines, kind of at the, the, the faster end on the left, these are the implicit solvers. So you can see even with a time step of like five, the implicit solver is stable and it is actually fast. Conversely, if you look at the explicit solvers, which is the dotted lines, if we try and take a big time step, it's fast. So this dark guy here, but it's unstable, it fails to learn like only only where we take a really small time step is an explicit solver able to learn uh finally like the black guy in the middle dot pre five uh this is an explicit solver but it's taking optimized time steps so it's it's able to mix it with the implicit guys yeah um yeah so let me summarize then i was going to hand over to ben so we can talk about questions um i guess the advantages are grand as so there's a learned diffusivity so it's this edge detection, which means we kind of fight against like this, this heat death or in the diffusion to a steady state, which means we can go deeper and it's a more expressive network because of the depth. Um, and using these advanced solvers gives us some stability and offers new architectures. And I'd say my main critique is the spatial discretization because it's heuristic and we do it at the start. Um, we think we, are, we found a solution in Blend, uh, which is a nice segue to hand back to Ben to talk about Blend. Um, but I guess as Ben is sharing his screen, I take all the questions that accumulated. I'll stop sharing, Ben. That's, yeah, maybe, maybe we should, before we consider going into more, more questions, let's ask Ben, um, how, how long do you think this, this part will take? Because then let's maybe, uh, you have to leave in 15 minutes, so let's maybe, uh, wait with the questions until you're done with your presentation here. 
You're still muted. You're mute then. Hmm. I, sorry, it just took me a really long time to find the unmute button on Zoom, which is a bit embarrassing, but I found it now. That's because Twitter uh, uses Google Meets, isn't it? It's Google Meets, yeah. Uh, so I don't have a hard uh, a hard deadline. It's just uh, how cross my wife is with me for doing this while we're on holiday together. Uh, that's, a, that's a good deadline. <laughs> a good reason. Yeah, it's not bad. It's not a bad deadline. Yeah. Uh, this, uh, I think it's about about 11 and a half minutes so that at least that's how long the neuro video recording is and it's the same slides okay well dominique you decide if you want to go ahead or if we should rather wait and... I, I think it's a simple question so uh, i'll go ahead uh, can you go back on the slide where you show the number of layers and uh, with the performance uh that one Yes, that one. Um, so in that slide, one thing that we can see and that has been discussed uh, repeatedly in the literature and even in blog posts by Michael Bronstein is that uh, the performance for GCN is best with one or two layers. And this is on the three data set core up of Med and sites here. Um, one thing that's uh, that I would like to note here is that when you use um, some ODE solver, the number of layers is not equal to the number, uh, is not uh, necessarily the number of neighbors that you're going to see because you have this uh, notion of time step. So even, well, in fact, you will see more neighbors, but because of the time step, some of the neighbors will be incredibly diluted if they are far away. Uh, and on core wrap up and sites here, it's well known that the information comes from very local structures. So here I would just like to know whether you think that this test accuracy is uh, really the overcoming of oversmoothing, or is it because the time step is so small that even with 32 layers, the network adapts to only look at the very close neighbors? Uh, do, so do you have an idea of what time step you used in these experiments? I, I think in this... Um... Specifically in this experiment, we actually resorted to using an explicit Euler. So we want we wanted to uh, be able to make a true comparison between the time step of uh, yeah, so one step in grand and one step in GCN. So I think we set the time step equal to a fixed number. Maybe it was one, maybe it was less. Um, so where you where you see layers on the bottom, eight layers is actually eight steps in the GCN because we use explicit Euler. I think. Um, that hard, that I guess that's more context for the questions and answering uh, the proximity of information. Ben, do you have any thoughts? Well, yeah. So my my mental picture of what's happening here is that we are is this idea of edge detection, and so we are we are kind of cartoonizing the graph. You think of the graph as an image. It's a bit of a stretch, but think of the graph as an image. And what we're effectively doing is we're cartoonizing areas of the graph that have different classes and not really allowing diffusion to happen outside of those areas. And therefore, you can go a lot deeper because you're kind of trapping the signal within certain uh, class boundaries. Now that, that's, that's what my, my mental image is. Now, whether that's what's really happening or not, I'm, you know, I'm not exactly sure, but that's what I think is happening. Yeah, also, also to that point, with, with the attention, because it's softmax, um, now, if you think about the numerator in soft, softmax, it's an exponential, right? So you can get very small numbers and then very big numbers. So you really do get like, uh, obviously it's normalized, uh, but you do get some, and you can see that I think there's like a super picture, pic, super pixel picture in Grant, which is like the MNIST image. You can see that the attention over the boundary, the, the lines get very thin. So it really does like cut off and it doesn't share like information diffused between what it thinks are edges or boundaries between groups. So it allows the diffusion to happen within a group, but not across the groups. Yeah, so that's, uh, that's very interesting indeed. So it means that even when you go with very deep layers, uh, because the diffusion is controlled in a way to not allow it to go uh, 
to go further than what it should. So the network is still able to focus the information locally, despite being very deep, whether GCN is definitely not able to do, do that and the information will spread across the graph. So I think it's a very interesting conclusion and it would be very nice to have like a study on actually what's happening. Um, it, thanks it, a lot it, for answering the question. Just like another point on it, it's like, um, it's like you, you, what you want to do is at the end of the diffusion, you want to have a state where it's easy, it's linearly separable. So it's easy for a classifier to say, this is one class, this is another class. So not only do you, you cut it into areas, but if you say, right, this is one area, because it's diffusion, it means everything within that area will approach the median, but the mean value. So it, it clusters within the, like the, the different groups you found. Cool, Ben. Sorry, I'm eating into your. No, that's that was a nice segue actually into the next uh, into why we uh, why we did blend. So the the left hand image here is grand. So having established that you need some way of controlling how information flows across class boundaries, one way of doing that is what we did in Grand, which you had this learned diffusivity function, which acts as, acts as an edge detector and makes it more difficult for information to flow across class boundaries. The issues with Grand are that the, the rewiring in Grand is it's a, bit, it's a bit hacky. We weren't very happy with it. And we went digging again through the uh, computer vision, the, I think it's called what is it called? Total variation computer vision. I think that's what the field's called, or some, sometimes it's called scale space methods. And uh, we found this Beltrami flow for images paper. And in, Beltra in, in images, this idea of Beltrami flow is where you, you imagine an image as being a, an embedded manifold. So not just the space, not just the 2D space that the image is on, but then you, you make an image of sort of three a two manifold in 3D space where the third dimension is the intensity channel. And then you evolve this thing. And now you still have the heat flow equation, but instead of the Laplacian, you now have the Laplace Beltrami operator, which is the, the manifold, the differential geometry version of the Laplacian, which is the Euclidean operator. And Essentially, what we're doing here is just making it harder for information to flow across boundaries where the intensity or color channel or for graphs, the feature space changes a lot. Um, actually, one more thing to say about this. So this now, now we really are in the world of having an underlying manifold. We kind of left this idea of the graph being the real manifold. And that's, that's really wonderful because now we have something that's something that's evolving that the graph is almost a sample of and and that gives us a principled way to do rewiring but to get from the image idea where you have very clear directions up and uh, you know up and right and left uh, to get that for graphs you need some sort of position encoding and this is my intro to positional encoding slide so this idea at least as far as i'm concerned first uh, came to our attention in machine learning through the transformer but in a fairly mysterious and cryptic way. So they have this equation in, this is in Dashwani, I think it's in Dashwani. So the original uh, attention is all you need paper, I think, if I, if I cite that, yes, I have. Uh, and they have this sort of mysterious 10,000 in the denominator. Um, and then I think no one really understands this equation, or at least I don't understand this equation, why, why it has that form. But since then, I think the machine learning community and including Dominic, has come a long way in terms of understanding positional encodings and applying them to graphs. And there are many, many different options now. So uh, random node features, graph Laplacian eigenvectors, paper, uh, Dominic's paper, graph substructs accounts, bags of subgraphs. And I think Michael's group, uh, Michael's extended group has done a lot of work on this. I'm just gonna check the question here. Is it trivial to apply it to regression? Um, I don't know, James, you wanna think about that while I'm doing these slides? So that's uh, positional encoding. So now you have, once you have positional encoding, you can concatenate that to a feature encoding and you can perform a Beltrami evolution. In computer vision, the, this idea, this uh, Beltrami flow in computer vision was, it was nice, but it, was, there was, it wasn't very elegant because you evolved an image, you evolve both these positional coordinates and these feature coordinates using a diffusion equation, using this Laplace-Beltrami diffusion equation. But then at the end, 
you have you've evolved the positions, but you have to use the original positions because you at the end you want to get an image out. And so they just throw away the position and coordinates, which is a bit kind of, it's kind of nasty. Like you take all of this beautiful mathematics, which came from string theory, and then you just throw away part of it. It's, it's not that nice. But with graphs, it's actually really lovely because you evolve the features, you evolve the positional coordinates, but then you actually use the evolved positional coordinates to rewire the graph. So once you once you're comfortable with the idea that you don't necessarily want the input graph to be the graph you do computation over, then having a principled way to evolve the graph you're doing computation over is actually really, really nice. And we think it's more elegant to do this in graphs than it was in images. Uh, and then these next few slides are just a sort of illustration of what we mean. So you have, you have uh, feature coordinates. So this is the, the height here, and then you have positional coordinates. Uh, and this doesn't need to be, the position coordinates don't need to be Euclidean. And there are a load of papers over the last uh, four years, which have shown that in many respects, a lot of uh, complex networks, they live more naturally in the hyperbolic space. So this, <clears throat> this little circle here is the, um, I should know this, uh, the, the, <laughs> the oh, what is his name? Anyone going to help me? Uh, hyperbolic ball. Poincaré. Thank you. The, this is the Poincaré disk. And, um, and so now the thing that's evolving is this concatenated coordinates, this Z in our paper. So it's a, it's a concatenation of X and U. And so we can evolve the features and then we um, also evolve the positional coordinates. And then with the evolved positional coordinates, we can rewire the graph using something, uh, perhaps a KNN or something more sophisticated. And as a result, we now have an even broader generalization of other methods uh, than, than we had with Grand. Um, in fact, in the paper, we talk about how this generalizes other things like uh, even deep sets, uh, depending on the choice of rewiring and, um, and diffusivity function and uh, discretization. So most, uh, most graph neural networks are explicit Euler with step size one. Check the chat. My great disk. Yes, thanks, David. So when I first started working on this, when we first started working on this, the idea, the idea of evolving the positional coordinates through some sort of diffusion equation, to me seemed it seemed a bit weird. Like, so you're diffusing over a graph, but at the same time, the graph itself is diffusing. And I, I at least I struggled to get my head around this idea for ages. Um, but it turns out that this is a really, really common thing to do in differential geometry. And in fact, this is, this is exactly what Ricci flow is. So Ricci flow is this idea, you have a diffusion equation where you continuously evolve the metric of an underlying manifold. And Re uh, Ricci flow, uh, quite recently, uh, for mathematicians anyway, I think this is a 2006 or something like that, uh, was what Perelman used to solve the Poincaré conjecture. So a lot of people uh, in machine learning now are trying to work uh, work with Ricci flow and trying to think about how Ricci flow can be used in machine learning because obviously this is you know, one of the greatest mathematical breakthroughs of the last 20 years. And I think we will see a lot more work in this area over the next coming uh, decade. Oh yeah, and this uh, wonderful animation, I can say that because I didn't make it, James made it, is, uh, is what's happening, what happens to Cora, or at least what we think happens to Cora as you, um, as you run blend. So you'll see here that you start with a mixture of feature values here. We've um, projected the features into 1D and the positional coordinates are here 2D and the positions of the nodes evolve. And as they evolve, the graph is rewired using a KNN and the features and the positions are diffusing with each other. And eventually you start to get disconnected components that have roughly the same feature channels and hopefully also are all the same label. Uh, yeah, and so results there, yeah, we've left out the grand results because the grand results while being quite good are not as good as the blend results. So blend is, is better than grand. And we think actually, while, while some, you know, everyone has a results slide that says their thing does really well and does better than everyone else's thing. In this case, we think, and we do stand by the results being super strong, like in the, you know, so strong that they surprised us kind of strong. And we think they could even, uh, even be improved on further with the, with the things we're working on right now. But these are, 
these are better than most other GNNs. These are actually very strong results, we think. We did some uh, ablations, mostly because the NeurIPS reviewers asked us to do ablations of step size. And, and generally speaking, uh, the dot pre five. So the dot pre five is the four step runga cutter with adaptive step size uh, performs better than anything else. And this is what we used in most of our experiments. And this is generally regarded as being the workhorse numerical solver. So it's the default in MATLAB, for instance. It's not always true that it does best. So it's sometimes possible to do better with some Euler step if you get really lucky. But if you want to choose one, one solver, then the, uh, the dormant print is generally the best, which is what we were kind of hoping to achieve. And, um, and this slide here just shows the difference between blend with positional encodings and running it without positional encodings. So you don't then evolve the graph in any way. So it's always better. It's normally quite a lot better. And it's, uh, we compared here to GAT with positional encodings. And uh, I think James mentioned earlier that GAT is, uh, can be super unstable. So this result for computer and you see how huge the error bars are for GAT. And that's, um, that's also something I think they found in the pitfalls paper as well. Okay, two extensions that we would love to um, love to add to Blend that we're actually not exactly completely working on at the moment. Right now, the uh, the layer weights are shared, so the diffusivity function is is shared for every layer. We would love to evolve that, so we see the sharing of weights as an advantage uh, in many respects. So way way less parameters, keeps inference speed down, and it, and it, the results are really amazing. But it would be nice to have some way of smoothly evolving, uh, evolving the parameters. There is a bit of work. There's something called anode v2, which does this, but I think it's it's an underexplored area. The other thing that's really we'd love to add, and we've tried, and it, it seems to be uh, quite difficult, is is channel mixing. So if you just put, you can just put in a W into grand or blend, as in like the GCN A X W thing, but it just doesn't work as well. And it's way slower, and so there's no there's no point in doing it. But it should work well, right? Because um, because that's how a neural network works. And that type of diffusion that does channel mixing is also quite well studied. This guy Omsiga, he won the Nobel Prize in chemistry in, in the seventies or something. And um, there's a well studied mathematical framework that we as yet can't quite get work, get to work, but we'd love to in the future. Okay, so that's uh, I think this is the summary slide. So hopefully. We've shown that uh, graph neural networks can be thought of, thought of as numerical schemes that discretize PDEs. And there are two parts of a PDE that need discretizing, the, the temporal part and the spatial part. The temporal part can be discretized using the now quite large architecture of neural ordinary differential equations. The spatial part can be discretized in many different ways. And we think this is particularly exciting and an area for fast future work where you, can, you don't have to use a given graph anymore. You can imagine this thing as an underlying continuous manifold and sample it to give you a given graph. All right, and last slide. So um, I will quickly check the questions. Yeah, I think D Dominique's question is a really good one. Like this method seems to work super well with large and high degree graphs, but do you think it can work well with smaller sparse graphs like molecules? Yeah, interesting question. So we've never, molecules is mostly graph classification, whereas yeah. everything we've done so far is node, uh, node classification. And I guess we just don't, we don't know. So we haven't, we haven't tried. So I don't, I've never worked really with, with graph classification. Um, is it is it are there many specialist things that are involved normally with molecules or is it uh, are there do you use the sort of cookie cutter GNM frameworks? Well, I think like I'm not that experienced in the field, but I think the architectures that work well for small molecules are often quite different from the the ones that work well for like Cora or Sightseer. Yeah, I think that my understanding uh, is that it, they tend to be quite specialized but, methods where people who actually know about the underlying domain have to uh, have to get involved. Yeah, um, I mean, there, there are many architectures that 
um, are quite general and don't take like uh, molecular domain knowledge into account and work very well. Yeah, but I, I just meant that the architectures are often quite different from the like GCN and or yeah from the architectures that work super well on large graphs for node classification. But Dominique, for example, has a lot more experience in this with this type of stuff. Uh, first, uh, I'd like to thank you for the presentation. Uh, like those are two of the most interesting papers in the field of graph neural networks, in my opinion. Um, and I'm really, uh, I really like the neural ODE and the fact that you're bringing neural ODEs here and you're, you're not only showing that it works, but you're also animating it to really make us understand like why it works. Um, I, I think it's a very great talk. And also I, I like the template that you use for your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Twitter template, but it is nice. Yeah, yeah it is nice. Um, so one thing uh, uh, to to continue on that question about the the molecules, um, wh why I asked this question is that when you were dealing with uh, social networks or like some knowledge graph, often uh, the information rely on local information despite the graph having very high connectivity. And with your method, you see that these clusters are created, um, and these clusters are separated where each of the clusters will have its own uh, will have its own set of features when you're evolving the graph. And I was wondering with other graphs where more like the global connectivity is important in, in some sense and you don't want to break that. So you don't want to break a molecule into parts, but still breaking the molecule into parts can have benefits of identifying structures as well. Uh, so I, I was wondering like, um, whether you think it could work well, but if you didn't do the test, I think uh, you cannot know the answer. Yeah, I, yeah, it's it's difficult. I mean, yeah, it's it's. I, so I know. I mean, I'm just. I'm, I guess I'm sort of stumbling here, but I know in the in, in the Deagle guys' paper, they couldn't get their they couldn't get good results on anything except for node classification. And that's you know that is using diffusion to rewire a graph. So it's in spirit similar to this, um, but uh, yeah, I, I would just would just have to try it. I guess it's it's also a trade off with complexity, right? Because you can you can go to the extreme and do a fully connected graph, um, so everything's connected. Um, so when when we're doing a KNN, that's just kind of like reducing the edges to like local areas. We look to stuff like. How do we how do we like add edges like maybe by sampling or like kind of like thresholding on like occasionally calculating a fully cal like a fully calculated dense attention, um, but it, it started to get a bit heuristic. It wasn't very principled. Um, and another question also to go on that subject: uh, when you rewire the graph, um, have you thought or tried about using different rewiring in parallel as sort of multi-aggregation scheme because right now when you're separating it to community it's really easy to think that one node can belong to two different communities on two different aspects for example a node could belong in a sports league with some other nodes but then in a um, academic uh, perspective with other nodes if we uh, we're looking at social network for example uh, and ha have you looked at the idea of like having different um not necessarily orthogonal but complementary um, rewiring of the graph such that you use multiple aggregators this is quite funny because i wanted an excuse to use pytorch geometric 2.0 <laughs> with the heterogeneous graphs so i guess this this would be a, an interesting experiment to do right um so yeah i, I guess that there, I guess, where we concatenate the, um, the, the Z. So we have positional coordinates and we have feature coordinates. Um, and we're rewiring with the positional coordinates. I guess we just choose the indices of the concatenation and you can take some indices that represent 
I guess it's kind of like subspaces of the field, right? So you can rewire on one subspace and then take another set of indices and rewire on that. I guess that's that, that would be how you would implement it. Lots of lots of potential avenues for exploration. But I, I, that also that I guess that's um that's connected to the on sigma diffusion as well, right? So that's the feature channel mixing, which is essentially mixing the indices. Um, okay. Then you just sent a direct message. I think that was meant. Oh, I sent you a direct message. Sorry, I meant to send that to uh, everyone. Yeah, okay. I, I apologize. I, I accidentally sent it directly. Um, I meant homophilous graphs. So um, graphs where the neighborhood structure is very, very different from the node itself. So in a dating network, uh, you normally see in, in a large number of cases, it's men dating women. And, you know, men have different features attached to them, women have different features attached to them. And in this sort of a, in these sort of graphs, you have quite. I mean, they're very choppy. The feature space is very choppy. So if you try and create these sort of um, highly, uh, I want I want to say highly sort of boundary these boundary based uh, diffusion things, then um, how do you think it would work, or do you think this is just too choppy for something like a diffusion operator to actually work on? Oh, I, I see you've answered it there. Uh, yeah, I guess we're just as as Twitter, we are generally, you know, our, our initial motivation is always social networks or, or Twitter specifically. So I guess that's why uh, we don't probably have uh, that great answers for things like molecules or graph classifications, because we are we are mostly trying to do things with a large social network type graph. Okay. Um, so do you, so the types of social networks that I'm talking about, maybe I'm, apologies, perhaps I'm not as clear as I, I would have liked. Um, they're, the features of each node are, they're called homophilous or heterophilous networks, right? Yeah. And is yeah. That, yeah. Okay. So is that, I mean, do you have, uh, um, I guess I'm just asking if you have some sort of intuition, if if these sort of operator, these sort of diffusion-based um, approaches would work just as well in those cases? My my intuition with heterophilous graphs, and I think heterophilous graphs is one of the new exciting frontiers for graph neural networks, is that you need a more sophisticated uh, transmission function. So you need some, some notion of, um, perhaps it can be as simple as a negative attention, but some, some idea that you learn a function which is the opposite of what your neighbor or your neighbor's features are, which mm. you can't really do with, um, with a simple diffusion. So even though we have an attention function in grand, we still just use that as a way of aggregating information. And so it's, it's hard to, you, I mean, it can be reformulated, of course, to a more complex function, but you, you need some notion of a more, more exotic way of no, aggregating is the wrong word you need a more exotic, exotic function of your neighbor signal in a truly heterophilous graph so i think also the definition of homophilus and heterophilus is a bit is a bit shaky so some 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 people just think heterophilus means that your label has nothing to do with your neighbor's label um whereas you know, another definition is that you know it can it's often the opposite so you have an alternating signal and I'm not, I'm not exact. I think the most common definition is just you you have not necessarily, you're not correlated to your neighbor's features. Okay. And in which case then, you, yeah, I guess the diffusion based memory things like GCN don't work very well either. Okay. Well, so, um, thanks. To, oh, sorry, please go on. No, I, I was just going to quote. So I, I think there's a line in Deagle where they say, so diffusion improves graph learning, where they say, we assume homophily. Um, but if we were to attack heterophily, then we'd, we'd look at negative edges, which I guess points towards Ben's point about more complex edge types. Uh, okay, um, thank you. Um, thanks, uh, both James and Ben, thank you so much. It's a really, really great um, presentation. Yeah, it truly was a great presentation. And as 
already Shavan and Dom said the like, these two papers are there will be so much work on top of them I'm sure and they're truly inspiring but um, before before Ben's wife um, <laughs> thanks Alex. yeah I guess him taking away too much I yeah want to to have to give you the opportunity to say goodbye in case you want to leave um, or have to leave I think I should yes I definitely leave I told her I'd be uh, out of here 15 minutes ago so um, thanks again very, uh, very much for giving us the opportunity to talk to everyone and uh, the questions are really awesome and you've got our Twitter handle so you can direct message us if you have any follow-up questions or email or whatever we're very happy to help nice to meet you all I, I'm, yep. I'm also on the um, the log ml slack channel so please if you want to email direct or, or slack me on there I, I definitely pick up any because I, I think well I'm definitely keen to learn more about the stuff we've done through like people questioning and suggesting which slack channel do you mean Oh, yours. Yours. Awesome. See you, Ben. Bye, Ben. All right, sorry. Bye, right, thank you. The log ML, uh, your your group. Uh, yeah, it's lo low gag, <laughs> not the London Geometry Machine Learning Summer School, the uh, Learning on Graphs and Geometry Slack. Um,